The topic of this session is recent encounters with the laws relating to religious freedom. Uh, and I'm going to just briefly introduce each of the presenters and then turn the time to them. And uh, I think we're in for some really great scholarship. Rachel Miner and Anna Briner will be speaking on amicus brief analysis and religious freedom. Rachel Miner is the founder and CEO of Bellwether International, a 501c3 nonprofit that works in pre and post genocide communities to protect and promote freedom of religion or belief in the broader context of human rights. Bellwether works globally, including with Yazidi women and children in Iraq and with Boko Haram victims of all faiths in Nigeria. Past interventions include conflict resolution events, IDP camp literacy initiatives and education programs, sexual assault recovery and trauma healing, and working directly with religious and belief leaders to shape cultural attitudes to prevent mass atrocity. Bellwether works as a stakeholder to, uh, to UK Parliament, working with the APPG on International Freedom of Religion or Belief, which incorporates membership of over 120 parliamentarians and the Special Envoy for International Freedom of Religion or Belief, Fiona Bruce. Domestically, Bellwether works with International Religious Freedom Secretariat to coordinate roundtables and a global religious freedom media strategy. With an undergraduate in economics and women's studies, Rachel utilizes interdisciplinary interventions that center on gender and development, GAD, and the household as a major economics unit of influence. Rachel has worked extensively on public policy in the United States Senate, and as well as the Utah State Legislature, in addition to informing policy in UK Parliament through various written reports. Rachel presented at the Harvard University's Faith and Flourishing Symposium in 2021, sharing her research on the uh, intersectionality between honor ideology, child sexual abuse, and religious freedom. And she continues to research how economic indicators can be used to predict and prevent the persecution of religious and belief minorities. Anna Briner is a student at BYU Law School from Price, Utah. She earned a BA in communications and a minor in political science from BYU in 2021. During her undergraduate studies, she worked at the International Center for Law and Religion Studies and co-founded the BYU Freedom of Religion or Belief Club. After law school, she hopes to work in constitutional law with a focus on religious freedom. In her free time, she enjoys hiking, playing the piano, and of course, cheering for BYU football. All right. Good morning. Uh, we will be presenting about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints legal advocacy for religious freedom, as represented in the amicus briefs that the church has submitted since 2008. My name is Anna Briner. And I'm Rachel Miner, and we want to start with a caveat, namely we are not formal representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So we want the research to speak for itself, independent of our opinions, independent of outside. This is the church speaking on behalf of their own briefs as presented through our own analysis. So how do we come to a place where amicus briefs, which as mentioned, are friends of the court submissions, these are parties that are not necessarily the counsel in the Supreme Court, but are putting forth suggestions or recommendations to the court on what should be decided. How do we approach this analysis? Well, we've really come down to three questions to guide our research. First, what are the interests of the church as evidenced by their submission of amicus briefs? Second, how do watershed moments such as a Obergefell change church advocacy, if at all? And third, what are the moral, philosophical, policy, and legal analysis or questions that are, that are presented by the church in their own arguments? Question one, what is of interest to the Church of Jesus Christ? Well, we see in our approach specifically, their interests vary over time. We look at specifically the time period 2008 to the present, which is when Proposition 8, 2008 was when Proposition 8 became a, a key priority for the Church of Jesus Christ. And it's also when we see a huge attention shift in religious liberty, particularly in the public sphere. Now, religious liberty has long been defended and long been a priority of the church. But for the sake of our study, we're focusing on this time period, which encompasses 16 amicus briefs and it covers a lot of interesting questions, particularly in regards to who did the church submit with, what are the arguments of these briefs, and what else can we glean from insights? Now, the church has been submitting, as Rachel said, um, for several decades. The earliest that we found was 1978, 
And from 78 to 2008, when we started our research, there were 12 cases that the church either filed a brief in or attempted to file a brief in. However, we see a significant increase, especially in the last decade, um, which was within our research span. There were 17 cases that the church attempted to file in, 16 of those the Supreme Court agreed to hear. So just to put it on a timeline, um, we started with 2008, as she said, because that's the year that Proposition 8 uh, took off. And we wanted to see if there was parallel advocacy at the Supreme Court um, for religious freedom or issues related to Proposition 8. Um, for the first four years after 2008, there wasn't any advocacy. That's largely explainable by the fact that the Supreme Court did not hear many religious freedom cases during that time period. But since 2012, in the last decade, every year the church has filed at least one brief, if not multiple. And you can see, um, leading up to Obergefell, there are a few, and then since then, sort of an explosion of religious freedom cases. Um, not all of those are directly uh, relating to implications of Obergefell, but many are. And so you can see that there's been a significant increase in both the Supreme Court's interest in this topic, as well as uh, the church's advocacy. It's interesting to know as well the broader context for these briefs. So who else is talking about these issues? What other organizations are submitting briefs to the Supreme Court? So this graph is giving you the total number of briefs submitted under each case, and it's in chronological order, starting in 2012 with Hosanna Tabor and going up to the present. So these are just the cases that the church has submitted brief on, but in a larger context. So you'll notice, as Anna mentioned, there isn't really a general trend showing an increase in the number of briefs submitted, but a particularly noteworthy insight is where the most briefs are being submitted overall, and that's overwhelmingly in cases with LGBTQ plus topics as it relates to religious freedom. So you can see Holling Hollingsworth v. Perry and then Obergefell being a watershed for more than one reason, 140 briefs submitted to the Supreme Court, all the way up to the most recent case, Fulton v. City of Philadelphia, which also concerned LGBTQ plus topics. So how do we take 16 amicus briefs, hundreds of uh, briefs submitted by other organizations, and pull out from that key interests and topics from the church? It was actually quite easy. The church comes back to four key topics again and again and again, namely religious autonomy, meaning the church's ability to operate with their own power and authority independent of government regulation, religious exemptions, and... Um, religion in the public square and same-sex topics, uh, LGBTQ plus topics. This is a little misleading though. This gives you the impression that topics are siloed, that they're independent, that they may not overlap. So this next graphic is actually a more accurate depiction of what the church is interested in. Primarily, first and foremost, religious autonomy as the key priority of the church. Within religious autonomy, religious exemptions, how do, we, how do we exempt religion in certain cases? Within exemptions, religion in the public sphere, and lastly, same-sex marriage and LGBTQ plus topics as a specific case study and example of religious exemptions. Now, in order to influence these different topics, um, there are several sources of law that the church is trying to influence the interpretation of. So some of these might seem um, a little bit obvious, um, the First Amendment, we have the two religion clauses. The free exercise clause, just as a review, provides the affirmative right to freely exercise one's religion. And then the establishment clause sort of draws the line between church and state, um, defining what the relationship can be there. Then we have the 14th Amendment, which does not directly pertain to religious freedom. Um, rather, it ensures that states um, give equal protection under the law to their citizens. And we see this come up mostly in discrimination contexts, where um, the church is sort of trying to carve out room for religious exemptions um, in a broader civil rights schema. Um, looking at the federal laws, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, sort of attempts to realize, essentially, um, some of the provision or uh, rather the intent of the Equal Protection Clause by preventing discrimination, such as on the basis of color, uh, race, sex, national origin, and religion in different contexts. And then we have the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which makes it possible to receive religious exemptions from federal laws. So to see where these laws sort of fall in relation to the cases, um, this is our chart. As you can see, uh, the majority of cases do fall under the Constitution. They're constitutional questions, uh, particularly related to the religion clauses. But you can also see there are um, a significant number of clauses either fall 
cases either follow, uh, falling under the Equal Protection Clause or the Civil Rights Act. So there's this interest not only in uh, influencing the interpretation of sort of your regular religious freedom law, but also how do we help um, religion and religious freedom fit into this broader civil rights schema. Now, where is the church successful in its advocacy? Well, in 75% of the cases where the church has submitted a brief, the court has agreed with the church, meaning it found for the same party that the church um, supported in the brief. And looking over at the screen chart here, um, all of those cases where the church and the court agreed, they all fall under either the religion clauses or the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So where the law is directly related to religious freedom, we tend to see that um, the church and the court agree. Where it's often less the case is in the context of the Equal Protection Clause or the Civil Rights Act. Um, in all three of these cases here, they all fall under either those two sources of law. Same with these three cases where the, the judgment was vacated, so we don't know what the court would have held. However, we do want to note that um, <laughs> sort of calculating it just in terms of wins and losses is a bit misleading. When the church is advocating, right, it wants key considerations to come out in the opinions of the court, regardless of whether the court finds for the party that the church um, supported. So in some ways you could say Obergefell, which made a specific mention of religious freedom, um, was not just you know plainly a loss because the church's advocacy potentially influenced um, the inclusion of or the mention of religious freedom and the need to continue it in that opinion. Now we want to just briefly mention the court, uh, sorry, the church has not submitted a brief in every religious freedom case and we won't go into speculation on the reasons why here but we just wanted to give you an overview of that fact to note that um, our previous slide does not represent um, you know the total uh, representation of religious freedom cases and how they've been interpreted under different sources of law. It's also important to note that doctrinally related questions uh, the court, the church has not been advocating on, um, and it could have, right? Um, but all of, all of the church's amicus briefs always pertain specifically to the relig religious freedom implication. Now, how does the church work with other organizations? Let's first note that the church has never submitted a solo brief. Whenever they're commenting on religious freedom, it's always in partnership with others. In fact, for the 16 briefs that we analyzed, they partnered with 57 organizations, the majority of which are Christian, as expressed in our charts here, but they've also partnered with Muslims and Jewish organizations. What does that express? The church is thinking about religious freedom in interfaith terms in multilateral terms, and they're thinking about a lot of other perspectives that go beyond policies specific to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So that leads into our second question. How is Obergefell a watershed moment, both in terms of LGBTQ plus topics, but also in the broader range of briefs being submitted, as Anna explained in our timeline? And has their advocacy approach changed, if at all? Let's start with a core tension in Obergefell. Namely, this tension between identity claims and religious claims. On one side of the court, we have Justice Kennedy, who wrote the majority opinion, assuring religious believers that they can continue to advocate, they can continue to teach, and they're not required to condone same-sex marriage. But on the other side, we have Chief Justice Roberts, who's expressing a very different opinion, saying that this case is going to cause serious legal questions for, the, for religious freedom and claims brought in the future. So how do we justify and understand this core tension? That's part of why it's a watershed moment. We need to recognize that when we see these tensions in the court, what's fundamentally being acknowledged is a zero-sum game. The idea that when you take a religious claim to the court, one side wins, and one side loses, and that's harmful. Religious freedom is inherently nuanced, it's inherently complex, and that's part of what this tension is acknowledging. There's a lot of perspectives and opinions going into these kinds of cases, and we need to be considering the broader threats to religious liberty. So with that core tension in mind, what changed pre and post Obergefell? In this context, we're looking specifically at LGBTQ plus uh, claims and, and the timeline pre and post Obergefell. So pre Obergefell, what do we see? We see the church taking a very strong stance in the zero-sum game kind of analysis. They're looking for one side to win 
They're particularly concerned about moral claims as it relates to a traditional definition of marriage. And they're particularly mindful of the role of state power in regulating morality. This isn't unique to briefs, but it's certainly unique to the church who primarily emphasized judicial tests and influence in their briefs, which comes through post Obergefell. So we see the continuation of judicial tests, proposing, trying to influence where the Supreme Court thinks about religion and re religious claims. But we also see the church change their rhetoric in terms of aside winning and losing and promoting instead this idea that both sides are promoting an identity claim in the end. One side, an identity claim that relates to sexual orientation, and the other, other side, religious freedom, also an identity claim about religion in the public sphere. And we see a lot more interest in, in creating these compromises, which in the legislature we see through the Utah Compromise and other proposals put forth by the church. Lastly, let's note the secular notion of animus. This is a phrase that comes from Justice Kennedy, meaning we need to be very mindful of labeling religious people as inherently hostile just because their sincerely held religious beliefs are in tension with other identity claims. Post Obergefell, this is a key priority for the church moving forward. So now question three, what are the different arguments that the church has made in its briefs? Uh, like Rachel explained, all of these topics are really overlapping, right? And we're going to break down our analysis according to these topics, but we want to note that the division is a little bit artificial because often uh, multiple interests are implicated in these cases. Uh, but to begin, religious autonomy, like we've mentioned, this is the notion that the state should not intrude into matters of the church, that the church should be able to regulate um, all aspects of what it does, including who it employs. And that's what we see here in the ministerial exception. There are two key cases on this, um, which have strongly protected the right of religious institutions to be able to freely choose who they will, cho who they will hire or um, you know, use to serve in positions as clergy or the equivalent in um, other religions. So I won't go through all of these, but the main idea here is that we don't want to have an impermissible investigation by the state into the church. And this is something that undergirds sort of all of the further cases and topics that we'll be talking about. Now, religious exemptions. These also, once again, have to do with religious institutions being able to freely exercise their religious beliefs as well as individuals, and in one case, for-profit corporations. So um, some of these cases have fallen under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which specifically allows for religious exemptions to federal laws. And in those cases, the church has argued that for-profit corporations should be covered under this act, meaning that they can obtain um, exemptions. And then they've also taken interest in this uh, third-party harm issue, which is um, the idea that if, if the government requires a religious institution or um, a for-profit corporation um, to provide some sort of benefit to its employees, um, and, and the religious institution says, well, that would violate our beliefs to do that. Um, just because you might have to go around that, you know, if you give an exemption and then um, allow for that benefit to still reach the employees, the church says, we think that that should be okay, that just because you might have to accommodate and there might be um, a burden to third parties, um, that shouldn't be a blanket ban on being able to bring an exemption claim. Another exemption is when same-sex couples are seeking services, particularly wedding services, which is a reoccurring theme in the court. The church has made clear that any case re revolving around weddings actually fall under a completely different category of exemption. Why? Because weddings are inherently religious, and we have to understand them in that context in order to appreciate the claims being brought forth. They also talk extensively about this idea of regulation. What's happening when religious liberty is constrained by government? Religion is being regulated, and the church is concerned about this concept. So they're putting forth in both Masterpiece Cake Shop, a case about wedding services, and also, also in Fulton v. Philadelphia, a case about adoption agencies, that neither religious or secular beliefs should be regulated in any form. The church makes clear that regulation is a harm to all belief systems beyond just religious. 
And lastly, they put forth that if there is this idea of animus, as we've explored earlier, there needs to be a mutual suspicion. We can't just be suspicious of religious hostility. We must also be suspicious of secular hostility. So next, religion in the public square. This really comes back to two core legal concepts. The first is the Establishment Clause. So the Establishment Clause, meaning the government cannot establish a religion of choice or a preferred religion. In this case, we see the church put forth a judicial test, and they call this test the Founders Test because it center, centers around the idea that the Establishment Clause should be understood from the perspective of the Founders. And they put forward these seven reasons for why it should be so. These seven reasons being completely holistic in scope and quite powerful in protecting the interests of religious and belief groups. So this is a powerful example in American Legion of where the church is putting forth that judicial test to the court. The second legal argument behind religion in the public sphere is the separation of church and state. And this really comes back to a couple of different cases, but in the context of monuments, the American Legion case about the large memorial cross that you can see in Maryland from, from a prominent freeway, they're thinking about this separation of church and state in actually quite inclusive terms. We tend to over-exaggerate the separation and say, no, the separation of church and state means you can't bring your religion into the public square. The church disagrees. And they promote that we need to beware of extreme, strict separationism. If we divide secular notions and religious notions too far, we won't be able to bring our conscience at all of any kind into the public sphere. And that's something to be mindful of. Another context in which we see uh, sort of the church being involved in trying to define the permissible relationship between church and state is in religious discrimination contexts. And when I say religious discrimination, what we're talking about here is the government discriminating against religion, um, meaning persons or institutions. So initially the church took the stance um, in two key cases that there should be a balancing test, that it should weigh in favor of religions being included by the government. So if the government's going to fund something um, that you know organizations can apply for, a religious organization should be able to apply unless there's a really compelling reason to justify not allowing that. However, in its most recent brief, the church actually shifted positions to make this a stronger position for uh, religious persons and institutions. It argued that there should be a categorical ban on religious discrimination. And um, so this is sort of responding to the fear that the Establishment Clause can be used as a justification um, really easily to say, well, we're too worried about improper entanglement between church and state, so we're just going to leave you out of this program. Um, the idea here is, no, there, it should be presumptively um, possible for religious institutions to at least apply or attempt to be um, able to receive public benefits on par with secular organizations. So we've started broad and now we're going to end very specific. Same-sex marriage and LGBTQ plus topics nested in all three priorities for the church. So we see a couple of main themes coming out. Again, this idea that states should reserve the power to regulate, if at all. State powers, meaning states should decide uh, regulations and laws surrounding same-sex marriage, around tax exemption, the Utah Compromise being a glowing example of what the church is promoting here. Second, beliefs about marriage do not equate with beliefs about homosexuality. This comes back to the secular notions of animus. This comes back to mutual suspicion. When the church is defending a sincerely held belief about marriage, they're not inherently discriminating or making broad statements about a group of people that believe differently. And again, we see the church going back to moral claims, promoting definitions of marriage that they've crafted and put forth in multiple briefs. So their definition of traditional marriage is intergenerational, meaning it centers on the child, on the rights of the child, and on the family unit centering on the relationship between parents and child, versus the definition they put forth for non-traditional marriage in their briefs, which is the affirmation of adult relationships. It's interpersonal rather than er intergenerational. And considering those definitions and where they overlap is critical to the church. Lastly, they put forth, again, this idea about identity and overlapping identity claims between religious persons and the LGBTQ community, promoting again and again, there are places for us to agree 
There are places for us to protect each other, and this does not have to be a zero-sum game with a single group having all of the freedom or all of the claims, and that has to be balanced, especially, especially in an increasing politicized context of religious freedom. So given all of uh, what we've discussed so far, what have we learned about the church's advocacy? Well, before we get to our conclusions, we want to just keep a few factors in mind. Number one is that our, these amicus briefs often contain multiple legal arguments. So we don't find the argument or the rationale necessarily to be uh, the most indicative of the church the church's belief, but rather the end to which the argument is seeking to achieve. Often these arguments are uh, um, attempting to uh, draw the support of a variety of justices who have different interpretational methods. Um, in addition, it's important to note that the church is not the one drafting these. So uh, as we've mentioned, the church always has partners, and even when the church is the one leading out, um, it employs, uh, it contracts with other counsel. So it's not um, anyone at church headquarters writing these, but they have endorsed them, right? So it's not to say it doesn't represent the church's position, but I think authorship is important to keep in mind. And then also to remember that not every case um, is a case that the church is necessarily interested in the overall outcome of, but rather uh, the church often uses these cases to express a certain issue or um, a certain uh, priority to the court, hoping that it gets included in the overall rationale. So key takeaways. First, in addition to partnering, the church has actually never submitted an amicus brief independent of religious freedom. Religious freedom is a core priority of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And even if the brief didn't directly relate, it always had undertones and connected back to religious freedom in some way. Second, the church is interested in influencing the Supreme Court in the long run. They're putting forth judicial tests, both categorical protections where inference should never be allowed, balancing tests in the case of identity claims, and this idea of original understanding, the founder's test and the establishment clause. Next. The judicial tests sometimes are to promote an actual standard to be adopted, but more often than not, they're actually to prevent harmful precedent from being adopted that will further harm religious liberty. And lastly, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is thinking in interfaith terms. They've never submitted a brief alone. They're thinking about partnerships. They're thinking about the intersections for all people as religious freedom relates to them in the human rights context. So we're very grateful for your time. We, we encourage you to email us for uh, any details on our slides. There's a forthcoming publication on more of the legal nuances that we explore here. So please cite our research. Thank you so much. We appreciate your attention. Thank you very much to our presenters. Um, we have uh, time for questions. We want to wrap up at uh, 11.30, I believe. So we have about, depending on if you're looking at that clock or mine, that's 10 minutes. This one's more like 12 minutes. Um, and I'm going to do my best to juggle between online and offline. And I presume that we'll have the presenters coming up here to respond. This is uh, for Rachel Miner and Ann Reiner. I remember your names correctly. What is the role, including the extent extent of that role, if any, uh, played by the um, first presidency of the church with respect to the decision to file amicus briefs and their substance? So I don't want to overspeak on this issue. We have um, asked about this. We were able to uh, talk with one of the lawyers who wrote one of these briefs. Um, but from our understanding, typically uh, the process has been that um, one of these either attorneys from that sort of partnered with the church in the past or the counsel for uh, these other partners will approach the church and say, hey, we think we have this uh, legal issue in this case that it would be the, the church has a stake in this. This is the kind of thing that uh, we think you would want to be involved in. So from our understanding, it's usually attorneys initially approaching the church, um, making a recommendation to the church's general counsel. And then that does go up through to the first presidency um, for approval to participate. And presumably, um, 
to be able to approve the brief as well. Um, the general counsel plays a part in that. And from the perspective of uh, the attorney that we talked to, um, it was his understanding that the first presidency also is, you know, kind of signing off on these. Um, as far as influence beyond that, I'm not quite sure. We do have a, a member of our first presidency right now with significant knowledge in this area, but um, he's not the one writing these briefs. So I hope that helps. Did I answer your question? Uh, ben, we've got a couple hands in the back. I'll let you decide where you want to go first. Um, I actually have two questions. First of all, I also want to say I really appreciate all three presenters. Um, with respect to the amicus briefs, uh, why do you think there's an aversion to getting involved in abortion cases, which you specifically pointed out were uh, not included? With respect to the last speaker, um, my question is, um, and all of a sudden the question fled from me, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and it was the one I actually had first in mind. I'll come to it in a minute if I remember. <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, this goes largely back to an understanding of what the court does, and as we've mentioned, the binary outcome of the court. I think. It's, this is a lot of what we share is speculation in this regard as well. We have a lot of questions that goes beyond the scope of our research. From, but from what we understand, instances such as abortion are, are far more complex than a win-lose. And that's reflected actually in the church handbook and their policy on abortion. And so in a lot of these cases where we know the church has interest on a topic that relates back to religious freedom but hasn't put it forth to the court, then there's an understanding that there's more nuances or complexities that the church would rather work out in their own sphere of autonomy than take the, to the Supreme Court for uh, a final binary decision. Uh, maybe two questions if I can sneak in. The, the bigger question is any trends or patterns in the partners on the briefs and, and, there, and it looked like pretty much religiously, politically conservative partners which is a little bit at odds with the uh, common cause on the legislative front when it comes to LGBT questions, right? To try to reach across the aisle and across factions. Um, any developments to suggest that we're trying to reach out a little more than the, I'll call it the conservative camp on those briefs. And then related to that, this last case, the main case, it's an unusually stark argument. It seems to be a very strong argument is that being affected by the facts of the case or by partners or just something else? So um, in regard to the question about the partners, um, out of those 57 partners, I would say about three quarters are Christian, um, probably sharing often similar um, sort of positions um, as the church. And as far as reaching across the aisle, as in, you know, if we were to partner with um, other, I guess, maybe you're referring to sort of how with like the Utah Compromise, uh, there was a lot of effort to reach out and um, coordinate with groups from the LGBT community, right? Um, we haven't seen anything like that in these amicus briefs. Partly, I would think that's um, a little bit explainable by the fact that I think it would be difficult maybe to bring that kind of partnership to a case, right? Because we're in an adversarial context, and I think that's why the, ch the church is able to do this in a legislative context, why it advocates for these decisions to be left to the legislature so that that kind of broader coalition is possible. Um, I will say we do have, in several cases, um, Jewish partners and even Islamic partners, um, but I would those are very much in the minority overall in terms of who we partnered with. So. If you'll just repeat that second question regarding Obergefell. Uh, oh, sorry. It's, I think it's the main case that's, that was the, the most recent brief you have. It, may, maybe this is too specific, but it seems like the, the argument that Dushku puts forward is, is, is really saying we, we don't want balancing. There's, there's no role at all here for the government to, to, to discriminate. And that seems unusual in light of some of the past arguments. I just wonder if that's because of the specific facts of this case or if it reflects the partnership, or if you have any ideas of some other factor. Yeah, so this case, Carson v. Macon, um, you're right that it does take a strong turn. Um, reading that brief, it's specifically all about the test, right? It doesn't actually go into very many facts of the case at all. Um, I think the, uh, 
the reason that we see this stronger push is just that with the strict scrutiny test, there's still always this easy way kind of to invoke the establishment clause. And I think there's a lot of fear that that can be used um, to uh, create, you know, to prevent religious organizations from being involved. It's, it's kind of difficult um, teasing out the logistics of when religious organizations are trying to apply for funding. Um, how do you, where do you draw the line, right? Can they apply, but then you just always reject them? Can you apply? How do you determine if it's an impermissible relationship between church and state? So I think they're trying to advocate for a position where it's going to be easier to participate and the establishment clause analysis is going to have to be done after there's this initial presumption that it's okay for um, participation. And I'll just add one other nuance. One, one thing that we go into into our research paper itself is the, uh, the style for which different attorneys representing the church approach these same issues. So we have Alexander Dushko, we have Douglas Laycock, we have Gene Scherer, all authoring separate briefs, and it's very interesting to see how they bring unique perspectives, narratives and styles back to this argument of religious autonomy, and that comes through very clearly as you read the 16 briefs. Thanks for your question.